All right. 2023 is over tonight at midnight. Some of you are like, I don't know about you, but for me, praise God. So some of you had an amazing year. Those of you that know me and know, know my family and know my life, 2023 was up there with 2020. Uh, it was one of the worst years of my life. Uh, Christmas Eve, no joke, Christmas Eve, like a week ago, I get a call, hi, this is the head of uh, the ICU, you know, blah, 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 hospital. My uh, half-sister uh, is on life support, and we're talking DNRs. And I'm like, this is how my Christmas is going to go. Praise God, we pray, and I talked to the doctor for a long time, and uh, my sister pulled through, and um, she actually got released. She's home now, uh, which is crazy. So, yay, God. But... It's just been one of those years, you know? Yeah, I'm glad to see 2023 go in to 2020, 2023, yeah, good riddance. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the presence of God in 2024. When a year comes to an end, some people could care less. Some people get kind of reflective and, and like broody and you pull out your journal and you sort of feel things deeply. I'm just gonna ask you a question. Was 2023 better than you expected or worse than you expected? And here's why I asked the question. When a farmer goes out to har harvest and reap what he sowed, if he planted corn, he's going to reap corn. If he planted wheat, he's going to reap wheat. You reap what you sow. So you're at the end of the year. You have reaped the seeds that you have sown previously. And if you don't like the harvest that you have received, why don't you ask the Lord for a new harvest in 2024 and plant new and different seeds than you planted in the past? Does that make sense? You can't plant the same seeds over and over again and expect different results. If you want a different harvest at the end of 24, you're going to have to plant different seeds in January of 24. Why don't you join us on 21 days of seeking the Lord in prayer and fasting? Because if you want things you've never had, you're going to have to do things you've never done. And here's the thing. Seeds are tiny. Like, you're not trying to plant this giant thing in January. You know, you're just planting little tiny seeds of faith, seeds of devotion, seeds of love for God, seeds of breaking off of sin and addiction and fear and hopelessness, seeds of faith and joy, and seeds of learning how to host the presence of God. It's not some giant thing, it's just a lot of little thing, because in that seed is the DNA for a giant harvest. Corn stalks are taller than my head. You're like, you're 5'8", that's not that hard. Rude. But a corn kernel, a seed, is only this big. An oak tree starts out as an acorn, tiny little thing, grows up to be 40, 50 feet in the air. The seeds that you plant have huge repercussions, so be very careful what seeds you plant in 2024. A good seed will always reap a good harvest. A bad seed, I guarantee you, will produce a bad harvest in your life. So, we need to plant Holy Spirit seeds. We need to plant seeds of devotion to the Lord, of, of, of hosting his presence. And here's the funny thing. Sometimes you'll do just a couple of small things, but the results don't equate or compare with our natural understanding. Does that make sense? You're like, well, if I do 21 days of prayer and fasting, then this is going to happen in my life. Don't bet on it because the math, the science is not natural. So don't try to calculate it with a natural mind. You just devote yourself to the Lord and you just plant seeds of faith and devotion to the Lord and see what the Lord might do in your life and let him blow you away with a supernatural harvest of his kingdom come on earth as it is in your heaven. Because every day is a seed. Every moment is a seed. Every thought is a seed. Every word that comes out of your mouth is a seed. So I want you to learn to plant seeds of faith and seeds of love and seeds of hope. Plant the word of God into your life. So let me also say this about New Year's tonight. Some of you got born again this year. This is going to be your first New Year's sober. This is going to be your first New Year's where you don't sleep with somebody you're not married to. This is going to be your first New Year's uh, where you don't get high. And um, because people that are fully loved and devoted to Jesus, they don't do those things on New Year's. Does that make sense? Some of you are like, oh, I got to text my boys and make some, <laughs> sorry, I can't make it tonight. Because if, if that's what you've done for your whole life, don't do that tonight. 
Don't go out with those people. Don't go to those places. Stay home. Have some people over. You can watch Ryan Seacrest drop the ball, or you can put some worship music on and seek heaven. Hello. You can, you can devote, you can plant seeds for 2024 in those very first moments. We, um, I bought a um, whole slab of prime rib for Christmas because if I bought it from Costco, it was literally $12.99 a pound. If I bought it from Albertsons with a double, triple digital coupon where I had to sell my soul a little bit <laughs> and the manager had to come make sure my soul was fully sold, four eighty eight a pound, but you buy the whole slab. So I bought the whole slab of prime rib and, you know, we were a family of like six and a baby, so I didn't need 17 pounds of prime rib. So what I did was I, I took a while and, and I sharpened our, our, our butcher knife and I just cut out the middle for prime rib for Christmas and then we had the most amazing ribeye steaks Christmas Eve. It was lovely, last week. You ever try to cut a giant piece of meat with like a dull knife? And it's just like, you're just working and it's just like the meat is laughing at you and calling you names. But you take a few moments and you sharpen that knife and that same exact knife cuts through like a hot knife through butter. Fasting sharpens your blade spiritually. Would have been a good place to go. We're going to get better at that in 2024. If you feel like, oh, that's a good little thing, I want you to immediately burst into like, yeah! Don't hold back. Fasting sharpens your spiritual edge. So come on, somebody. So we're kicking off 21 days of prayer and fasting. Why do we do fasting? If you're new, I'm going to take just a few minutes, and I'll share more about it tomorrow night. We fast because we are fixated on food. Americans in particular, like I, I know that we say that baseball is the national pastime. No, fam. Eating is the national pastime pastime. We have TikToks and we have YouTubes and we have Instagrams and we have television networks as if anybody watches television anymore. All about food. You, you, you pin your favorite food. You follow your favorite food people. We love food so much that we will take our food from the kitchen. Nay, not to the dining room, to the couch so that we can eat our food while we watch people make other food. We just came through Christmas and, 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 and Thanksgiving. I ate so much food in the last five weeks. It was as if I stole the food and I was trying to hide the evidence before the police came. I ate an unbelievable amount of food in the last five weeks. We invented Thanksgiving just to overeat. It is the holiday of gluttony. We love food. Here's the problem with our devotion and adoration and love for food. It's something that Jesus said, and it messes with me. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, when you fast, I hate the word when. When you fast, don't look somber like the hypocrites. They disfigure their faces to show other people, hey y'all, I'm fasting, and I'm going to make a big deal about it on social. Truly, I tell you, that's all the reward they're ever going to receive. Here's that word again, verse 17. When you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face, don't make a big deal about it on social media so that it will not be obvious to other people that you are fasting, but only to your Father in heaven who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Hannah, just leave that up for a minute. Let that soak in. There is a reward that comes from the Father, and it comes for those that fast. Jesus said, when you fast, not if you fast. And so often, we treat fasting like it's optional. Me personally, if fasting were optional, I would never pick that option. I love food too much. But for the believer in Jesus, fasting is not optional. It is mandatory. It's normal behavior to fast. And if we do, and we do it with the right attitude, and we do it with the right heart, and we do it as an act of worship and sacrifice, there is a reward 
that comes from God. It doesn't come from your spouse that admires you. It doesn't come from the church. It certainly doesn't come from me. It comes from God. And he sees what you did in secret, and then he will reward you. Because we're trying to receive a spiritual reward, not a natural reward from other people that think we're amazing. Now, the reason that we're changing the fast this year, and I, I put it in the email that three of you read. Thank you, Donna, for reading the email. Yes, I saw your Facebook post. And yes, Marlena, I saw that you didn't read the email and you saw it on Instagram. Yep, you're welcome. That's why we did Instagram. That was Jordana that suggested that. Um, when I read Matthew chapter 6 and Jesus said, when you fast, not if, when you fast, I was always thinking about it in the American mindset of the Daniel fast that we made up in the 70s. And somebody wrote a book about it, and we've all been eating fruits and vegetables in January ever since. But in context, Jesus is Jewish, talking to Jewish people. When he said, when you fast, he's talking about the Jewish fast, which is 24 hours, no food. Many of the devoted, no water. And they'll do that from sundown to sundown, 24, 25 hours of complete fasting. There's several fasts that the Lord calls the Jews to do. So when Jesus said, when you fast, he was talking about complete fasting for 24 hours. Translate that into uncommon culture. We can't do that for 21 days. So let's do 23, one. We will fast, and I don't know about you, I would encourage you, I mean, I'm not quite there where I can do no water for 21 days. So 23 hours, water only, one hour, go ham. Literally. <laughs> unless you eat kosher. Now, if some of you were like, I'm down, I'm gonna do this. It sounds really difficult. Why are we doing something so hard? I think it should be hard. Does that make sense? Like, I think the American church has designed the church around making life really easy for the church people. And I really don't see that in the Bible. So I don't want an easy faith. I want my faith to be tested from time to time. Because when my faith is tested, it, it challenges me to go deeper and get stronger. They, they put trees in a biodome in Arizona about 30 years ago. They built this big biodome, perfect temperature, perfect humidity, perfect water, perfect nutrients and resources. Everything was growing pretty well, except for the trees. The trees were dying. And then one of the scientists was like, wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And they dug up one of the dying trees, root ball, and they put it outside, and the wind began to blow on that tree, and the tree came back to life. We need resistance to make our roots go down deeper and to strengthen us in our core. So by choosing willingly to fast for 21 days, a difficult fast, we're choosing a strenuous thing to test What's stronger, our body and our stomach or our spirit man? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is encouraging the church in Corinth to really take their faith and their pursuit of Jesus seriously. And he uses the example because it was the Roman world of the marathon and the Olympics. He says, guys, don't you know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets a prize? So you should run. He's talking to the church. You should run in a way that you're going to get that prize. Everybody in the games, they go into strict training. Say strict training. And they do it to get a crown that will not last. We do, we do it. We do what? We do strict training to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I don't run like somebody that's just running aimlessly. I'm running with purpose, and I'm running in strict training. I don't fight like a boxer who's just shadow boxing and beating the air. He said, I'm a box, but I'm going to box a blow to my own body and make my body my slave so that after I have preached to other people, I will not be disqualified from the greater prize. Jesus said, when we fast, there is a reward that comes from the Father. And Paul talks about we, from time to time, need to put our bodies into strict training. Why? So that we will receive a reward that lasts 
forever. So there is power when we learn to physically restrain ourselves and then walk in a spiritual freedom we had not done so before. That's why we fast. Why 21 days? Because whoever wrote the book in the 70s about the Daniel fast said that Daniel did it for 21 days in Daniel chapter 1. Sure. But Daniel was just trying to eat kosher. Does that make sense? He wasn't trying to create a fast for the American church. Daniel just didn't want to eat all the snake and crabs and lobsters that were on the table in Babylon. He was trying to be a good Jew and eat kosher, so he said, just bring me fruit and vegetables. Daniel chapter 10, and this is where I think we should fast for 21 days. Daniel chapter 10, Daniel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord was downloading some things about the end times to the prophet Daniel. And the Lord responded to give a word about the end times to Daniel. But that angel, that word, was held up in a spiritual battle for 21 days. And Daniel cried out to God, and it took 21 days to defeat the demonic power and for the word of the Lord to be released. And it was actually the angel Michael that came. And he battled for 21 days and brought the word of the Lord to Daniel. I believe the word of the Lord for Uncommon Church for 2024 is the word presence. But it's going to require us as a people to battle our flesh and to battle our self and our selfishness and to take up our cross and to die daily so that we can begin in 2024 to experience the presence of God like we've never experienced his presence before. So we're going to pursue the presence of God like we never have before. And we're going to do it for 21 days. There's a famous verse that everybody knows, but I want to read you the verse after that. Jeremiah 29, 11. Um, this was written at the end of the Babylonian exile. The people were still in slavery and bondage, but that God began to speak prophetically to a future hope. He says, I know the plans that I have for uncommon church, declares the Lord. And these plans, they're for spiritual welfare, not for evil. And they're going to give you, these plans that God has for our church is to give us a future and a hope. Amen. We all know that. We love that. We give it to high school seniors when they graduate. The Lord knows the plans he has for you. Don't go get drunk and high in college. Verse 12. So then you're going to call upon me, and I am going to come. So you pray to me for 21 days. I'm going to hear you. Verse 13. You seek me. And you're going to find me if you seek me with a little bit of your heart. Praise God. Oh, Hannah, you have the Bible version of the Bible where it says you're only going to receive the future and the hope when you seek the Lord and you pray if you seek him with all of your heart. No more limp-wristed, mamby-pamby, kumbaya Christianity. There's a reason why this fast is going to be difficult. It's the reason why we're going into strict training is because we're pursuing the word of the Lord and we're going to fight for it for 21 days because we want to experience the power and presence of God that like we never have before. Now, if you're new to Jesus stuff and you might be like, what do you mean by the presence of God? Does God have multiple presences? One presence for our church and a presence for other people's churches and a presence in my house and a presence for our kids? No, 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 fam. The presence of God is the glory of God so imagine the book of Revelation. Imagine God enthroned in all of his glory in heaven. The presence of God is the glory of God that we experience on this side of eternity. We don't experience the full measure of his glory or we would melt. But it's the same glory that is poured out from heaven on the earth and we experience the power of God, the presence of God, the peace of God, the love of God. It's how we experience the glory of God on this side of eternity. You don't have to wait to die and go into the throne room of God to experience his glory. You can experience God's power and presence in worship, in prayer, in your car, in your cubicle, in your bedroom. So in this season, for 21 days, I want us to devote our hearts to seek the Lord and that we would press in to his presence, that we would never be in a hurry when we come in to worship him. Why? 
because Jeremiah said there is a future and a hope. And I think we could use a lot more hope in our, in our lives right now. All right, let's start winding this thing up. James chapter 4. There's a promise in here that I want us to embrace. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Verse 8. This is what, when the church is going to be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., when we have nights of worship every Wednesday at 7 o'clock, when we encourage you to fast, draw near to God, and the Lord God will draw near to you. It is a promise from heaven. There's more to the promise, though. You don't just get to come to God the way you are. Verse 8, uh, sorry, second part of verse 8, you have to cleanse your hands, you sinner. Purify your heart, you that are double-minded. So if you've had one foot in church and one foot in the world, if you have been kind of just averagely, just, just kind of uh, uh, pursuing Jesus, that's not going to work for these next 21 days. If you're going to seek his face, you're going to have to go all in. You're going to have to get serious. You put your big girl panties on and pursue God passionately, completely, entirely. Seek his face. Draw near to him. He will draw near to you. Like what we did this morning in worship, learn to linger in his presence. Don't be in a hurry when we're in those moments of worship. I don't want to, I said it before, I don't want to be good at church and bad at God's presence. I think a lot of people are great at church, but bad at his presence. I want to learn to experience the presence of God in a deeper way, in, in, a, in a more passionate way. And then here's where people are like, wait a second, you don't need to talk like this with the presence having coming and not coming. The Bible says, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, that when two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them. So... Yeah, thank God. When two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus, it is an attraction. He's like, look, they're, they're, they're gathered in prayer. They're gathered in worship. Just two or three is all I need, and I am there in the midst. Yeah, Jesus loves when his children get together. We're not meant to pursue God's presence alone. How about that? We're meant to come to church, not watch on YouTube. We're meant to get involved in a small group. We're, we're meant to come to the altar and get prayer so somebody can lay a hand on our shoulder and speak faith and prophetically into our life. There is power in multiplication. And the Lord loves when his family gets together. So yes, of course, we should learn to host the presence of God alone in our home. But there is something powerful when two or three are gathered. The Lord is attracted to our fellowship. But... There's more. Just wait, there's more. He wants to be invited in. Does that make sense? We bought our home a few years ago, but before that we lived in several rental homes. And um, the funny thing about renting a home or an apartment, the owners, they're not allowed to just walk into the house. I, I'm just renting it. I'm just occupying it but somebody else owns the home. But even though they own it, they're not allowed to come in unless I open the door and I welcome the owner in. So in Genesis chapter one, at the beginning of the book, God said, you know what? Let's make man in our image after our likeness. And let's let let's, this man, this humankind, let's let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens and all the livestock over the earth, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. Only two genders, according to the Bible. Verse 28, God blessed humankind, and he said, y'all, go be fruitful and multiply, make babies, plant gardens, fill the earth, subdue the earth, have dominion, over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. The earth is the Lord, and everything in the earth is the Lord's. But he gave it to mankind to have dominion over. He owns it. He's allowing us to rent it from him. 
So it is our jobs in worship. It is our job teaching our children around the table. It is our job in our bedroom when we're alone to humble ourselves before the owner and open the door and say, Lord, would your presence come in to my house? Would your presence come in to my home? Would your presence come in to my worship, to these altars, to our children, to our teenagers? Would your presence come? You own it, but you gave me dominion over it. So I bow and I say, Lord, come with your power. Come with your presence. I'm inviting you in. I need you so desperately on the earth, which is why Jesus, the disciples said, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? He said, yeah, pray like this. Father, your name is holy. Let your kingdom and your will, what? Come on earth, just like it is in heaven. So Lord, we need heaven to touch the earth. We need your, your kingdom to come on the earth. We need your will to be done on the earth. We need your presence to touch the earth. As it is in heaven, I want to experience heaven on earth. You don't have to die to experience heaven. We experience it now. But do you remember a few verses ago when James said, y'all just need to stop being double-minded. You, you purify yourself, you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Purity is a huge key to pursuing his presence. And here's what I'm talking about. Matthew chapter five, Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. Why? Because they will see God. You want to see the face of the Lord, the presence of God? Blessed are the pure at heart. They see God. Pure eyes, pure hearts, pure minds, pure Netflix, pure homes, pure screens. Purity. And those that are pure and those that are drawing near, they're going to see God. They're going to experience His power and presence. Hop up on your feet. I spent a lot of time over the holiday with my grandson. He actually turned eight months old. And um, you know how toddlers like start to learn how to be selfish and disobey and rebel? Eight months old, there's no sin. It's just pure as the driven snow. He's not trying to be selfish. He's not trying to hurt anybody. He's not trying to disobey or rebel. He's just trying to be cute all the time. And he's really good at it. The disciples, most of them were blue collar. They, they weren't like trained in religious things. Now all Jews would have had basic Torah training as small children. So even a fisherman would have understood and, and known the basics of the Bible. And, and every Saturday they would go and they would hear the, the, the Bible, the Torah portion read by the rabbi. So they would have had basic biblical knowledge. But there were some that were like, their whole life was devoted to prayer and to studying the Bible, the Torah. And, and these were Jews that were highly respected because of their, their wisdom and their, their, their piety. And Jesus said other verses, he like totally trashes these guys for being holy on the outside but impure on the inside. But in this verse that I want to read you, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, the disciples came to Jesus like a bunch of arrogant little twits. And they're like, hey, uh, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who has more Instagram followers? Who's written more books? Who's a bigger Christian celebrity? Who's the greatest? Because you're probably going to see me, right? Jesus is like, come here, boo-boo. And he picks up a little child. He says, truly I say to you, unless you turn, turn, change, and become like a little child, you're never going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't come from how smart you are. Doesn't come from how pious you are, how mature you are, how wise you are. Jesus said, whoever humbles himself like a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So in 2024, I want us to humble ourselves before the presence of God because I want us to have pure hearts like a little child. No fear, no mistrust, just precious hearts that have been purified like gold. Because the greatest in the kingdom of God are the most childlike, the most pure. 
the most like pure gold. Do you know how they, they, they purify gold? Gold, we all found out 15 years ago on the Discovery Channel on Gold Rush, is pulled out of the dirt and then it's washed with water. But even the chunks of gold that they pull out, it's still impure on the inside of the gold. So how do they get the impurity out? Fire. They put it in a pot and they heat it up. And as the gold gets warmer and hotter and hotter and hotter, the impurity rises to the surface. And then the one that's the master peels off the impure things, leaving the pure gold. So over the next 21 days, for all of 2024, I want us to, every time we come before the Lord, ask the Lord for his fire to burn in our hearts. And Lord, if there's any sin, if there's any impurity, Lord, let it rise to the surface. Let me repent and ask you to remove it and purify my heart. Make me like a little child once again. The apostle John had this beautiful vision in Revelation. And this prophetic word came to the church in Laodicea. It was a particular church in a particular town. And he's like, hey, church of Laodicea, I don't know where you guys missed the memo, but you were so lukewarm. Like, you've got half of your foot in the world, in the Roman, sinful, pagan, sexual, idolatrous world, and the other foot in church. And homie, don't play that. So you got to go all the way in or all the way out, but you can't stand in the door anymore. And here's, what, here's his advice to the church in Laodicea. That's, that's, that's kind of like average faith. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold that has been purified in the fire. It's going to cost you something. And you should also buy some white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and that the shame of your nakedness would not be seen and some salve to anoint your eyes. Why? So that you can see the presence of God. Because to those that I love, I reprove, I discipline. Like, like a vine, I trim it so that it becomes more fruitful. So be zealous and repent. If you haven't repented of anything for years, you need the fire of God cranked up on your heart. Because look at verse 20. Remember the issue of the landlord that owns my house. As a, I have dominion, but I want the owner to come in. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door of your heart. I stand at the door of your life. I stand at the door of your marriage. I stand at the door of your workplace. I stand at the door of your school. I stand at the door of this church, of this city. And I am knocking. I want to come in. I want my presence to come in. And if anybody at Uncommon Church is going to hear my voice and they'll open the door, I promise I will come in and I will eat with you and you with me. You will experience my presence. So for 21 days, we're devoting ourselves to the table of the Lord. For 21 days, we're denying our flesh and we're saying yes to our spirit. For 21 days, every time you come before the Lord, in this house and your house, I want you to ask the fire of God to burn in your heart, to purify you, that you would repent and remove the sin, remove the dross, that you would not be lukewarm, but that God would set your heart on fire. There was a house in my neighborhood when I was a little kid that caught on fire, burned to the ground. The entire neighborhood came out at midnight in our jammies and watched it burn. Let's set Uncommon Church on fire and people are going to come watch us burn. I am talking spiritually, not literally, weirdos. Some of you pyromaniacs are like, yes, no. There's a passion that burns in our hearts for more of the Lord. There's a purity that makes us rich spiritually because we buy gold that has been refined in the fire. We buy pure white garments that we're not just living holy on the outside, we're living holy on the inside. It makes us rich spiritually that we would take these 21 days and we would say, you know what? I'm glad it's difficult this year. I'm in. 
embrace it. Why? Because God is knocking on the door of your heart and God is knocking on the door of our church and saying, I want to come in. I want to come in and eat with you. I want my presence to fill you. And just personally, this is just Brad's interpretation. I think it's because the Lord wants to drop a joy bomb in this house. I, I just think that, 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 that he, he wants to turn our frown upside down. That, that there needs to be like a baptism, like when you go in the water and you come fully out, that we would go fully into the joy of the Lord. Psalm 16, you make known to me the path of life. In your, in your, is the fullness of, in your, is the fullness of, look at this, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You that know your Bible, who is seated at the right hand of the Father right now? In Jesus, there is fullness of joy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I'm glad it's tough. I don't want it to be easy. For 21 days, I want to beat my body and make it my slave. I want the fire of heaven to be poured out on our house, on my, my couch where I sit with you on this church, on these altars, on this piano, on our children, on our toddlers, on our young people. Lord, I'm asking for your fire to burn. We're saying yes. I'm saying yes. Yes, Lord. Purify me so that I can humble myself, open the door, and that your presence would come in. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I need to speak to some people that are here in the room and that are watching on YouTube. If you're not right with God, don't take the sin and the disobedience and the rebellion and the addiction and the pain that you've been carrying for all of 23 into 24. Like, how dumb could you be and still breathe? Repent. Repent. Ask God to forgive you. Surrender your life to him so that starting tomorrow morning, January 1, you can live a life fully devoted to seeking the presence of God, to eating your daily bread and letting the word of God transform your life, to worship, to be holy like he is holy, to put on garments that are white. So if you're here this morning or you're watching on YouTube and you've been lukewarm, you've had one foot in the world and one foot in church, you have not been fully committed to the Lord, or maybe you've never committed to the Lord, I want to lead you in a prayer to repent of your sin, ask the Lord to forgive you, and receive that white garment, receive that purity on the inside, not just the outside like a faker. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you this morning and you need to pray this prayer, it might be the first time you've ever prayed this prayer. It might be the first time in a long time. But if you need to pray a prayer to get right with Jesus, would you shoot your hand up real high and just say, Preacher, that's me. I need to get right with God. I see your hand and I see your hand. Anybody else? Just shoot your hand up. Okay, good. No, I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand. Anybody else? Come on, this is fun. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right, YouTube. Four people are like, dude, I'm not taking this funk into 24. Four people raised their hand and said, I'm going to get right with God today. What about you? Right there between you and that screen, just shoot your hand up and say, Lord Jesus, today is my day to get right with you. Why not, if you believe it in your heart, it's so important to me that we pray these things out loud. If you believe it in your heart, why don't we all together pray and say, dear Lord Jesus, I repent. I surrender my life to you. Forgive me of all of my sin. Wash me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Let the fire of God burn in my life and remove the sin. Make me holy like you are holy. Give me a passion for your presence. Let me experience you like I never have before. That I would taste and see that the Lord is good. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. I receive the gift of eternal life in Jesus' name.
If you agree, say amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, I am so proud of you. Oh, man, I'm so proud of you. Wow, 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 wow. All right, we're going to do a few things. We're going to learn to practice his presence. Most of you have already received prayer. So I'd like the, the prayer team, not everybody, just the, the normal, smaller prayer team to come down. If you didn't get prayer, or maybe that God spoke something to your heart in the message, and you're like, oh, crud, I need to go get prayer. That these men and women love you. They're praying for you. But the rest of you, I, I want you to worship the Lord. I want you to start to entering into his presence. Um, if you are at home and you prayed that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time, we want to screw in a light bulb with your initials or your name on our Jesus wall. And if you're here today, we want you to do it yourself. Because we want to pray for you and encourage you on your walk with God. But we don't know who you are. So would you text the name Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, to 817-405-2244. That's just going to send a, a, an auto response form. Please fill out the form. Click submit. We want to pray for you and encourage you and put your name on a light bulb on our Jesus wall. 